Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel and welcome if you are new here. My name is Andrea M and this is Real Crime Down Under. On the 26th of January 1963, a young couple sat parked in their car near Cottesloe Beach in Perth, WA. It was coming to the end of the annual Australia Day celebrations. It was also an exceptionally hot summer that year with the temperatures reaching the 40 degrees Celsius mark, which is around 90 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. In 1960s Perth, there were no air conditioners, just a clunky fan or a sea breeze with many residents sleeping on porches and in backyards or sitting in their cars near the beach. As the young couple sat talking quietly, they were unaware that they were being stalked. Minutes later, they would be startled by shots being fired at them. They would both survive, however, and the young man only sustained a graze to his cheek by the first shot fired. They would drive away in panic, but a night that had been winding down Australia Day celebrations was about to erupt in terror. It was to be the night that would change Perth forever. But before we delve further into yet another Perth horror story, I would like to remind you guys to handcuff the like button, repeatedly offend the subscribe button and stalk the share button. Also drop a comment or two in the comment section below as it is subscribers just like you who truly help creators like myself further my career here and grow my channel on YouTube. And just on that subject, a big massive shout out and thank you to my first 105 subscribers. I just hit my first milestone, so many thanks to you all who helped and already subscribed. And those of you who aren't, what are you waiting for? That said, let's begin. And we visited Perth WA recently with our very first Real Crime Down Under where we explored the Morehouse murders in the 80s. This time we're travelling back to the 1960s and the serial killer who sent an entire city into panic one hot summer night in 1963. He would come to be known as the Night Caller and if you guys are kind of drawing familiarities with 1980s serial killer from LA, Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, I did too. The MOs are very similar, though not exactly the same, and it did happen during a scorching summer in both cases, where people were sleeping outdoors and leaving doors and windows open, just trying to escape the heat. On the night in question, the night caller would, in the late hours of the 26th of January, into the early hours of the 27th of January, 1963, go on to commit a series of random shootings with a 22 inch 55 centimeter rifle in the suburbs of Perth. The victims were the young couple who were wounded in their car at Cottesloe, a male accountant fatally wounded by a single shot to the head while asleep in a flat nearby, an 18 year old student named John Sturkey killed by a single bullet to the head while sleeping on the veranda of a boarding house in Netherlands and a retired grocer who was similarly murdered when he answered the doorbell of his house in the next street. Public anxiety was exacerbated by two murders a fortnight later for which a man named Brian William Robinson was charged with, tried for one and hanged. Robinson would not be the first to be charged with crimes he did not commit, but were in fact committed by Perth's most prolific serial killer, Eric Edgar cook. As we've already covered, he was nicknamed the Night Caller and later the Netherlands Monster. Eric Edgar Cook was born on the 25th of February 1931 in Victoria Park, a suburb of Perth, Western Australia. He was the eldest and only son of three children and he was born into a very unhappy, violent family. His parents married solely because his mother Christine Edgar was pregnant with him at the time and his alcoholic father Vivian Cook beat the boy frequently, especially when Eric would try to protect his mother. Christine would often sleep in the staff room at her job in the Como Hotel to avoid going home and being beaten by her husband. Cook himself was born with a hair lip and a cleft palate for which he had one surgical operation when he was only three months old and another when he was three and a half years old. 
The operations, however, were not totally successful and left him with a slight facial deformity and he spoke in a mumble. These disabilities also made him the target of constant bullying at school. This constant mistreatment caused Cook to feel ashamed and shy and he subsequently would begin to become emotionally unstable. Though very good at subjects that required retentive memory and manual dexterity, Cook was expelled from Subiaco State School for stealing money from a teacher's purse at only the age of six. And I tend to feel that that may have been Cook's roundabout way of trying to help his mother at the time. She was actually the sole breadwinner for the family. And I would say that the young Eric thought, I'm just going to grab this and take it for mum. I don't think it was actually a criminal type thing at this age. I mean, you have to remember, he's only six at this time. I think he actually was just trying to help his mother. So once he was transferred out of that school to Newcastle Street Infant School, he was again the target of bullying. And he continued to be bullied at every school he attended, including Highgate Primary School, Forest State Primary School, and Newcastle Street Junior Technical School. Cook was also placed in orphanages or foster homes on occasion. And taking after his mother, he would hide under the house or roam neighbouring streets just to escape a night of his father's violence. So this was pretty much on ongoing. If Vivian wasn't beating up his mother, he was beating on Eric. Eric was also frequently hospitalised for head injuries and had suspected brain damage because of his accident proneness. Later, it was questioned whether these accidents were due to repressed tendencies. Cook also had recurrent headaches and was once admitted to an asylum. His reported blackouts later stopped after an operation in 1949 but I think we can all pretty much guess why he kept being hospitalised. I don't think anybody is that accident prone and he was being beaten at school and beaten by his father on a regular basis. Cook left school at the age of 14 and worked as a delivery boy for Central Provision Stores and this was in order to help his family. He would give his weekly wages to his mother who could not fully support the family with the money she earned just from cooking and cleaning. Many of Cook's jobs put him in hospital due to his accident proneness. So he may have been a little accident prone and he has ended up in hospital a lot after he starts work. So at a job in the factory of Harris, Scarf and Sandover, he was hospitalised after being struck on the nose by a winch. At the age of 16, he worked as a hammer boy in the blacksmith section of a workshop at Midland Junction, where he always signed his lunch bag, Al Capone. <laughs> that just that seems funny to me like a young teenager doing that at the same job he would suffer second degree burns to his face from steam he would also jar his right hand and injure his left thumb starting at age 17 cook would spend his nights involved in petty crimes vandalism and arson he would later serve 18 months in a jail for burning down a church after he was rejected in the choir audition. And this may have been to his deformities that caused him to mumble. So if he mumbles when he speaks, I wouldn't think that he would have that projection in his voice to be able to join a choir. During his later teenage years, Cook would sneak into houses and steal whatever he found valuable. These crimes escalated to damaging clothing and furniture and acts of vengeance. He would then cut out newspaper accounts of his crimes to impress his acquaintances in attempt to gain friends. I'm sorry, honey, but if you're showing people that you're a criminal, you are not going to gain friends that way. On the 12th of March, 1949, police finally caught up with Cook and found evidence at his grandmother's house where he was living. Cook's fingerprints were matched to those found in the open theft cases. On the 24th of March 1949, Cook was sentenced to three years in prison after being arrested for arson and vandalism. He was convicted on two charges of stealing, seven of breaking and entering, and four of arson. He left many fingerprints and easy clues for detectives, which would teach him to be a little more careful in his future crimes. Cook was also described as a short, slight man with dark wavy hair and a twisted mouth. 
At the age of 21, Cook, I guess in an attempt to kind of clean his act up and, and better his life, joined the regular Australian Army, but he was discharged three months later after it was discovered that before his enlistment he had the juvenile criminal record. But during the training he did receive, he was quickly promoted to Lance Corporal and was taught to handle firearms, which in retrospect probably wasn't the best thing. On the 14th of November 1953, Cook, then aged 22, married Sarah Sally Lavin, a 19-year-old waitress at Cannington Methodist Church, and they ultimately would go on to have seven children, four boys and three girls. And no, Sally actually would have absolutely no idea that Eric was going around committing hit and runs and murdering people and shooting people in the Perth streets while she was at home with the kids. She, had, she just thought he was at work or at the pub or something. She didn't know what he was doing. During the 1950s and early 1960s, people in Australia frequently left cars unlocked and often with keys in the ignition. So Cook found it very easy to steal cars at night and sometimes returned stolen vehicles without the owners becoming aware of the theft. In September of 1955, after having crashed a car and requiring hospitalisation, Cook was sentenced to two years hard labour on a charge of unlawful use of a motor vehicle. He was ultimately released from Fremantle Prison just prior to Christmas 1956. After his release, he took to wearing gloves while committing these crimes in order to avoid leaving fingerprints which had been his undoing in relation to his prior breaking and entering convictions. So instead of going straight, oh no, no, he doesn't go straight, he doesn't try to better himself anymore, he just decides he's gonna wear gloves because he's learnt from his past mistakes that way. The mind boggles, honestly, the psychology of these people. So then we come to Cook's killing spree, which lasted over four years and the killing spree involved a series of seemingly unrelated hit and runs, as we explored just a moment ago, stabbings, strangulations and shootings. Victims were shot with several different rifles, stabbed with knives and scissors, hit with cars and beaten with an axe. Several were killed after waking up as Cook was robbing their homes while they slept, but two were shot while sleeping without anything being disturbed in their homes, one was shot dead after answering the doorbell and this was the gentleman who had been killed the night of Australia Day. After stabbing one victim, and this is absolutely icky, Cook gets a lemonade from the lady's refrigerator and he would sit on her veranda and drink it. And then one victim was strangled to death with a cord from the bedside lamp, after which Cook would then go on to defile the corpse and then he would strip the corpse and drag it onto a neighbour's lawn where he would defile it again with an empty whiskey bottle and then he would leave the whiskey bottle cradled in his victim's arms. Cook's murder victims were Penina Penny Berkman, Gillian McPherson Brewer, John Lindsay Sturkey, George Ormond Wormsley, Rosemary Anderson, Constance Lucy Madrill, and Shirley Martha McLeod. Another victim, Brian Weir, ultimately died as a result of permanent injury three years after having been shot by Cook that Australia Day. As the crimes were opportunistic and used varying methods and Cook's victims shared no obvious common traits, it was not understood that all these crimes were being perpetrated by one individual killer. And in fact, two of these murders, the deaths of Gillian Brewer and Rosemary Anderson were attributed to other men who would go on to be wrongfully convicted for these crimes. So now we're going to explore a little into the investigation that ultimately would see the police apprehending Cook. So the police investigation included fingerprinting over 30,000 males over the age of 12 because Nothing was being left behind at this stage and they had absolutely no idea of who was doing this, what age, where they were from or anything. As well as locating and test firing more than 60,022 rifles after a rifle was found hidden in a Geraldton wax bush on Rookwood Street, Mount Pleasant in August of 1963. 
ballistics tests proved the gun had been used in the McLeod murder. Police returned to the location and tied a similar rifle, rendered inoperable to the bush with fishing line, and then they would construct a hide in which they would wait to see if somebody returned to check on the gun. So Cook was noted loitering in his car in the area several times before this, and he was actually apprehended when he did try to collect the weapon just after midnight on the 1st of September. Add to this at the time, in a stroke of genius by the police, they actually contacted the local press and allowed the local press to go nuts with the story to say that a rifle had been located and that where it had been found and the police um, believed that this would flush out the perpetrator, that he would come to check on the rifle and as we just said, he did. So that was a real stroke of genius by the detectives who were involved in this case at the time. After initial denials regarding the McLeod murder, Cook cracked after one of the detectives, Max Baker, would snap at him, Cookie, you're going to hang and you know it. Because hanging was how they um, dealt with the death penalty in Perth at the time. There's no doubt about it. You've got a wife and children to think of and think about whether you're going to be dragged to the gallows like the mongrel dog that you are or go there like a man. And that's a direct quote from the detective. Cook would then begin confessing to his many crimes, including eight murders and 14 attempted murders. He was convicted on the charge of murdering Sturkey, one of Cook's five Australia Day shooting victims. And in his confessions, Cook demonstrated an exceptionally good memory. And the memory was of the details of his crimes, irrespective of how long ago he had committed the offences. For example, he confessed to more than 250 burglaries and was able to detail exactly what he took, including the number and denominations of the coins he had stolen and from every location that he had stolen them from. So there is a book, Presumed Guilty, by Brett Christian Rhodes, and it includes details of Cook's confession made over the two days in September 1963 at Fremantle Prison to his legal aid lawyer, Desmond Heenan. And Cook would also be quoted as saying, I have a great respect for the law, although my actions don't show this. I, I just can't see him having a great respect for the law. It just because if he did, he wouldn't, he wouldn't have kept committing the, the offences that he did. He wouldn't have been killing people. That's not a respect for anybody, especially the law as it is in itself. So... Cook pleaded not guilty on the grounds of insanity at the trial. Cook's lawyers claimed that he had schizophrenia, but this claim was dismissed after the director of the state mental health services testified that Cook was in fact sane. And the state would not allow an independent psychiatrist to examine him. Cook was then convicted of willful murder on the 28th of November 1963 after a three-day trial by jury in the Supreme Court of Western Australia before Justice John Virtue. He was sentenced to death by hanging and despite having grounds to appeal, he ordered his lawyers not to apply, claiming that he deserved to pay for what he had done. So this is like another weird contradiction. He tried to plead not guilty because he was insane, but then he turns around and says, yes, I deserve to hang for what I've done. I don't even know what to say about that. It's, it's so strange. So after 13 months in New Division, Cook was hanged at 8 a.m. on the 26th of October in 1964 in Fremantle Prison. Ten minutes before the sentence was carried out, Cook swore on the Bible that he had killed Brewer and Anderson, claims which had been previously rejected because other people had already been convicted of those murders. Cook was the last person to be hanged in the state of Western Australia. He was then buried in Fremantle Cemetery above the remains of child killer Martha Rendell who was hanged in Fremantle Prison in 1909. And I will actually do a whole video on Martha Rendell in a future Real Crime Down Under. So now we're going to explore Cookie's dead, he's gone. We're going to explore what happened to the two men that were convicted of crimes that he committed and were falsely imprisoned. So the first gentleman we're going to look at today is Daryl Beamish. 
and Daryl Beamish was a deaf mute and was convicted in December of 1961 of murdering Gillian McPherson Brewer, who was a Melbourne heiress, who was struck with a hatchet and stabbed with scissors in 1959. Beamish was initially sentenced to death, but the sentence was commuted to imprisonment and a later investigation, supported by Post newspapers and, and owner Brett Christian, led to his conviction being overturned. Beamish's initial appeal was dismissed because the court did not believe Cook's evidence. The prosecution claimed that Cook's confessions were an attempt to prolong his own trial and the then Chief Justice of Western Australia, Sir Albert Wolfe, called Cook a villainous and unscrupulous liar. The police case against Beamish is detailed in Christian's book, Presumed Guilty. And then we're going to move on now to the other gentleman who was also wrongly convicted of crimes that Eric committed and his name was John Button, and John Button was wrongly convicted for the death of his girlfriend, Rosemary Anderson, who died in Royal Perth Hospital at 2.30 a.m. of the 10th of February, 1963. Anderson had spent the previous day with Button in celebration of his 19th birthday, and like all young couples do, they had had an argument at his home that night, which culminated in Rosemary storming out and deciding to leave the Button House to walk home on her own. And John was obviously worried because this is only a few weeks after the Australia Day murders and these um, reports of these hit and runs that were going on at the time. So John decides to follow Rosemary in his car at different stages, trying to get her to get in the car so that she would accept a lift home and be safe. At one stage, John took a break to smoke a cigarette and upon resuming driving, he turned into a street called Stubbs Terrace in Shenton Park. And that's where he would discover the body of his girlfriend, Rosemary, lying beside the road. John would scoop Rosemary up in his arms and take her to a local doctor where she was subsequently transferred to Royal Perth Hospital by ambulance. The police became involved and interviewed Button, who after intense questioning and upon receiving notice of Rosemary Anderson's death, broke down and confessed to being responsible for her hit and run death. But what also went on behind the closed doors that night is John Button had been absolutely tormented by the police officers involved. They had been violent towards him. They had been questioning for hours and hours on end without break. Rosemary actually passed away during this questioning, but for a long time, John believed her to be in hospital and be receiving treatment for her injuries that night. And it was after he had found out that Rosemary had actually passed away that he just gave up. His girlfriend was gone. The police thought he did it anyway, so he thought he might as well just confess. And also because the police were relentless, they tormented poor John until he just cracked, until he just had no, nothing else to give and that was it. And he said, yes, I did it. After conviction for manslaughter, the courts dismissed Button's appeal, even though Cook had by this time confessed to the crime and provided details that only the culprit could have known about. In particular, the judges did not believe Cook's claim that Anderson's body was thrown over the roof of a Holden EK sedan without damaging its external windscreen visor, as Cook had claimed. And this particular car had like a visor that went around, sit back, like that, over the, wind, over the windshield to stop glare from the road. So over subsequent decades, Button and his supporters, including Christian and Blackburn continued to press for a retrial, a campaign that included a well-publicised 1998 reenactment of Anderson's death by simulation, and it was con conducted by crash test experts. With both a Holden matching one believed to be used by Cook on the night in question, and three Simca Arionde Cezannes, like the car owned by Button at the time, which were driven towards a crash test dummy. The dummy was thrown over the roof of the Holden as Cook had claimed and the damage sustained matched the records of a panel beating business that had in 1963 repaired the vehicle driven by Cook. The experts found that the sun visor flexed when hit by a body and returned to its original shape without cracking the paintwork. 
An expert from the United States was brought to Australia to prove Cook's car, not Buttons, hit Anderson. Despite Cook's 1963 confession, Beamish served 15 years while Button was sentenced to 10 years and ended up serving five. But when you're innocent, that's a very long time in prison. In 2002, the Court of Criminal Appeal quashed Button's conviction. Button's success opened the way for an appeal by Beamish, who was acquitted in 2005. In both cases, the appeal judges found that the murders had most likely been committed by Cook. On June 2, 2011, Beamish was granted a 425000 ex gratia payment by the Western Australian Government. Estelle Blackburn spent six years writing the biographical story Broken Lives about Cook's life and criminal career, focusing particularly on the devastation left on his victims and their families. New information on Cook and fresh evidence published in the book led to the exonerations of Button and Beamish. Another book was presumed guilty by Brett Christian. In Randolph Stowe's final novel, The Suburbs of Hell, he acknowledged there was a delayed response to the horror of Cook's murders, which he transposed for fictional purposes from his WA origins to a town resembling the English town he then inhabited, of Harwich. And Susan Faulkner's biography of Stowe revealed that it piqued his sense of humour that Perth Denison's at the time of the murders would knock on doors and say it's the Netherlands monster. I myself don't find that particularly funny. That's creepy. That's that's not funny at all. I, no. <laughs> a 2000 memoir by Robert Drew, The Sharknet, later made into a three-part television series, provided one author's impressions of the effect of the murders on Perth of that era. According to Drew, more people bought dogs for security and locked back doors and garages than they ever had secured before. And also, Cook as the Nedlands monster features in Tim Winton's 1991 novel, Cloud Street, and the subsequent 2011 television adaptation. And I'm actually listening to Cloud Street at the moment on Audible, and it's really good. So if you guys would like to listen to Cloud Street on Audible, I will give you a link in the description below. Cook is also referenced in Craig Silvey's 2009 novel, Jasper Jones. In March 2009, the second season of Crime Investigation Australia featured an episode about Eric Edgar Cook. In September 2016, Felon True Crime Podcast also reviewed Cook's crime spree in detail. In November 2020, Stan released an original four-part docuseries, After the Night, covering the story of Cook's murders. And I have also watched the docuseries and it is very, very good. So if you would like the link for that, I will also pop that in the description for you guys. And that brings us pretty much to the end of the story of Eric Edgar Cook, known as the Nightcaller or the Netherlands Monster. But before we end off today, I would like to pay respects to everybody who was a victim of Cook's and that includes the two gentlemen falsely convicted of crimes they did not commit that were actually committed by Cook. John Button, Daryl Beamish, Gillian McPherson Brewer, Brian Weir, John Sturkey, George Walmsley, Shirley Martha McLeod, Constance Lucy Madrill, Patricia Vinico Berkman, and Rose Mary Anderson. And my heart goes out to the families of the victims and to the families of Daryl Beamish and John Button, uh, who suffered so much humiliation and wrongful imprisonment because of Eric Cook. So once again, thank you guys so much for watching. I'm really happy to be back with you all again. Um, if you haven't watched my last disasters down under about Cyclone Tracy, I go into a whole thing about why I was MIA for a week, but it basically had to do with the fact that we had an extreme heat wave going on here. My air conditioner was still broken and it just made it absolutely impossible for me to shoot video for you guys, along with the fact that it was so hot, I ended up with a migraine for about a week. So I just had to take a week off 
And then when the air conditioner was fixed and the weather calmed down, I can get straight back into it with you guys. So thank you all again so, so much. Uh, I'll put links, as I said, in the description box below if any of the books or the podcasts or the, the television productions interest you and you would like to delve a little deeper into this case. I highly recommend the series on Stan uh, after the night because you actually get to see when John and Daryl get uh, their convictions quashed and their freedom and everything like that. And it's just really beautiful to see. And the thing that really got to me about Daryl and John was they were both such gentle people. They were really gentle men. There is no way on earth they would have hurt anybody. So I'm really pleased for them and their families that the convictions were overturned eventually. And my heart goes out to everybody who was a victim of Cook or had family members taken by Cook. And that's pretty much going to do it for today. Please keep your eyes peeled for I have another fun and spooky edition of the Oz Files coming up for you guys, as well as another missing persons case, which I hope to get to in the next couple of days. So thank you all again. And thanks once again to my first 105 subscribers. You guys rock. I wouldn't be here without you. And I'm just super, super appreciative. Okay, hope you guys have a good week. Please stay safe, stay aware, and I'll see you all back here soon. Bye.